Great, are we ready? Awesome. Hi everyone, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kathleen Collier. I'm the Arts and Education Director and Accessibility Coordinator at the North Carolina Arts Council. I'm excited to be joined here by my fabulous co-moderator, Dr. Lenora Helm Hammonds, who's the director of the North Carolina Central University Teaching Arts Certificate Program. Before we jump into today's discussion and introduce our guest panelists, um, I just want to extend a warm thanks again for joining us. Feel free throughout the webinar to type any questions into the chat box. I'll be moderating that throughout the program. So again, we welcome questions for our guest panelists. This webinar is being live streamed to the North Carolina Central University YouTube channel, and the webinar will be recorded and shared on NCCU's Teaching Artists Certificate webpage. So again, feel free to share this with any of your networks um, later on after today's program. Without further ado, I'm just going to provide a um, brief overview of what will be discussed today, and then I'll hand it over to Lenora. In this Teaching Artist Tuesday Part 3 discussion, we are joined by Co-Executive Director Haleya Deberos from Teaching Artists Guild, TAG, and some invited NC-based teaching artists to debrief on the first federally funded National Teaching Artists Conference resulting from a collaboration with TAG, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Department of Education, the Arts Education Partnership, and the Hewlett Foundation, held on April 5th through the 7th, just the other week, the event, Our Shared Future, A New Landscape for Teaching Artists, comprised of three-day workshops and panels with teaching artists of all disciplines in all regions of the country. Today, we plan to unpack and riff on the conversations from the conference and share highlights. We will hear these dynamic teaching artist leaders talk about resources available to teaching artists and ideas for connecting teaching artists across the nation. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Lenora. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello, everybody. We're so excited about this day. I hope you attended the, the conference uh, last week, Our Shared Future, Listening Together and Moving Forward. It was fabulous. It was a privilege to be a part of it, but I can't wait till we talk more and just kibitz about what happened and what we saw and learned and heard. Um, I just want to take a moment to read you the brief uh, bios of our fabulous panelists today. Haleya DeBarros served formally as executive director of Association of Teaching Artists in New York, where she developed an online professional development series and hosted an annual award ceremony. She has worked as education director at Art, Arts Core and with, and as a teaching artist with Lincoln Center Theater, McCarter Theater Center, New York Theater Workshop, the Center for Arts Education, People's Theater Project, Young Audiences New York, the Geffen Playhouse, the Los Angeles Music Center, the Orange County Performing Arts Center, Crossroads School for Arts and Sciences, CRE Outreach, and 24th Street Theater. Yes, this is a working woman. She was a recipient of the 2015 Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Creative Curricula Grant in partnership with City S School and is co-chair of the New York City Arts and Education Roundtable Teaching Artist Affairs Committee. Education is in, she has a BA in theater from the University of Southern California, an MA in educational theater from New York University, a British American Drama Academy Classical Theater and British American Drama Academy Classical Theater. Please put your E hands together for Haleya DeBarros. Our next um, panelist is one of the alum of North Carolina Central University's Teaching Artists Program. He graduated in 2017. He was in our first cohort. He teaches stringed instrument lessons in Durham, North Carolina, and he is co-founder of Bullhorn Arts and Education, a nonprofit organization dedicated to amplifying Dur Durham area music through play, performance, and possibility. Please put your e-hands together for Josh Zaslow. And last but not least, we have Bailey Clemens. 
She graduated from North Carolina Central's Teaching Artist Certificate Program in 2021. She's a music educator, a writer, a musician, a scientist, and teaching artist. She says the NCCU Teaching Artist Certificate courses furnished her with practical suggestions on what she can do to improve her teaching modalities and was provided a skill set to jumpstart her musical career. Additionally, the program has assisted her with starting a business plan and a marketing plan. She's built her own website and improved her performance and teaching techniques. The teaching artist certificate courses helped her to realize that she can do more than merely teach music and instill confidence in people by showing them their ability to meet and exceed their goals to grow as a musician. Let's put our E hands together for Bailey Clemens. So we'll start with our first question and I'll re reiterate what my colleague said, please for participants, put your questions in the Q and A and raise your hand and as we go along, it will be available live um, on YouTube after this event, but as we go along, your questions are really necessary and helpful. So question number one, we'll just get right to it. What were your biggest takeaways from our shared future, listening together and moving forward? The National Conference collaborated from TAG, the National Endowment of the Arts, the National Department of Education, the Arts Education Partnership and the Hewlett Foundation. Okay, um, so I would say for me from the first, from the first participant, looking at my notes here, Brittany Boyd Bullock as a visual arts, as a visual arts teaching artist, she's really great at connecting with youth. It's, I wrote down that she builds sustainable relationships with the Memphis youth and that she, she, she has a journey of cultivating trust and lasting relationships and just really looking into the next generation, especially as teaching artists, we educate, we oftentimes entertain, we engage, but we also evolve. So those were the four E's that I took away. Educate, entertain, engage, and evolve. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I'll throw that to uh, Josh. Is there, whether it's one particular um, person's or a panel or a plenary that you saw or an overview, like what are the overarching thoughts that you had for your takeaways from the conference? Um, probably the biggest one was to know your worth and don't be afraid to ask for it. Um, that was very much a recurring theme. Um, and a good one. Uh, another big one I took away was um, that um, as teaching artists, you know, we often face challenges of teaching um, subjects that uh, are not necessarily in our wheelhouse um, and kind of learning how to present certain subjects that um, in a way that that acknowledges that we don't know everything about that um, but still you know saying what we can about it and being respectful of that subject so those were the big ones for me that's awesome it's so interesting that we can um, feel like we are prepared and ready to do our work in our discipline and then be faced in the working situation in the classroom with, um, wow, this is out of my purview or this is out of my uh, realm of experience so far. And you know, how do I get that reflexivity that I need? Um, Haleya, I cannot wait to hear what you thought being <laughs> a founder of this event uh, and the realm of experience that you've had in, at so many different places. Yeah, I'm really thinking about these <clears throat> four E's, Bailey. I'm gonna 
I'm going to steal that. That's a, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, so simple way to talk about what we do. Um, I want to echo um, what Josh was saying. Also, I think the conversations, this is obviously near and dear to my heart too, because it's some of where a lot of my research has been around, um, around pay equity, knowing your worth and not being afraid to ask for it. But I think, um, the, the part that I was so excited about on the last day when we really said, let's, you know, let's dream. What are you going to do this month to start to advocate for teaching artists? So many arts organizations, hiring organizations and funders really said, I'm going to look at a mentorship program. I'm going to look at expanding professional development for my teaching artists. I'm going to figure out a way to give them a COLA raise. I'm going to look at planning in my budget so that I know I can pay teaching artists a cancellation fee if schools pull out, um, which we also saw was such a huge problem, <clears throat> excuse me, during COVID. Um, that, that advocacy and that sort of that awareness for the hiring organizations and for the funders to really get a clear idea of what it means to be a freelancer, I think is something, you know, many of us in the room have, have uh, struggled to accommodate ourselves with. You know, I grew up um, and was very fortunate to have two artists as parents. And so that was part of my upgrading with upbringing was having a family budget meeting every year. And I was used to those hills and valleys of income. That was the way that I grew up. And I realized in my twenties that so many of my other artist friends never knew how to do that because we weren't taught business skills. We were taught how to memorize lines and be prepared to come onto a movie set, but no one told you how to do your taxes later. Right. Um, so that that education um, for hiring organizations about what it's just like to be a teaching artist, I think, is so important. Um, and and I think my other, you know, just big takeaway, and this was one of our goals with the conference, too, was just to connect people to each other. I saw a lot of connections happening in the chat of great, you know, like you're in Oregon, great, I'm in Washington, let's connect. Like, I don't have all the money, but if we pool our money together, maybe we can do something great for teaching artists. Um, or um, I'm gonna reach out to you to learn about how you are contracting with schools um, in rural Montana, cause I'm in rural Kentucky and I think they might be similar. Um, and that's really what we were hoping was gonna come out um, of the asset map also. So it's just great to see people connecting. We know that this can be a really solitary career sometimes um, and finding the opportunities like Teaching Artists Tuesdays, some people might not even know that that was happening in North Carolina um, and, and making there, there be one, one place where people can come to find all of that regional information, which we hope is the TAG website. I love that, I love those different bullet points. I was writing notes as you were speaking, pay equity, thinking about taxes, thinking about uh, co-collaborations and pooling monies together and mirroring what people are doing in rural areas. And, and yeah, the Teaching Artist Tuesdays webinar that people can feel like tag and the efforts that you made in this conference is that go-to organization where um, we can discuss things. There were lots of rich conversations. There were lots of, um, I won't say combative, but differing, differing positionality about a lot of issues. Um, so what, you know, we'll start this question, this, you know, extending the, the question here. We'll stay with you, Halea, for a moment. Um, what surprised you the most about what you heard in some of the feedback or talkbacks during the conference sessions. I know the surveys are a whole different animal, but what surprised you the most, you and your team the most? Um, <clears throat> let's see. I, um, I think I was, uh, <laughs> This speaks to maybe how um, jaded I am. Um, I think I was most surprised to see that funders and hiring organizations were so open to the conversation. That's a real shift. Um, when we first started doing, you know, pay equity research in New York in 2014, 2015, there was just like brick walls with the hiring organizations. Um, 
And rightly so, they, you know, came back to many conversations saying we're also underfunded. All of the people who work in our offices also don't make a lot of money. Um, and that's a really valid claim and, and, and part of the entire nonprofit industrial complex, right? Um, it's a it's not a great funding model. Um, and that doesn't mean that um, advocacy and pay raises aren't due for everybody, right? Um, so I think I was most surprised to see that there were funders there, that there were teachers, classroom teachers there, that they came, they were engaging with the conversation. That is the first time that has ever happened. Um, I can't believe the conference even happened. The fact that we got the U.S. Department of Education and Arts Education Partnership and the NEA to collaborate on something is amazing, um, that they were recognizing teaching artists. And that really is because of individuals advocating. Um, the reason this came about is during COVID, the most calls that the NEA was getting was from hiring organizations saying, I don't know how to pay the TAs. I don't know what to do to support teaching artists. There's so much relief funding coming for artists. There's so much relief funding coming for educators, but this was this entire field that was being overlooked um, and is very diverse, right? As we saw in the conference, um, the needs are very different. Um, the needs in New York are very different than they are in Seattle, than they are in Chicago, than they are in you know, North Carolina, and they are in Kentucky. Um, and that's why regional networks are so important, in my opinion, because I get calls all the time that I cannot answer. I don't know what to tell you to do in North Carolina because I've never taught there, but I do know to say, you should look into NCECU's program. You should call, uh, you know, Teaching Artists Tuesdays. You should hook up with Dr. Lenora. You know, here are the people that you should go to. And I have those connections, you know, because, because I work at TAG or because of the asset map, um, but I'm not in a position to advise anyone who doesn't live in Seattle or New York. <laughs> That's awesome because the North Carolina Arts Council that collaborates with us for Teaching Artists Tuesdays made sure to come on board as a catalyst for other people knowing about the needs of teaching artists in our region, which took, a, took the work we were trying to do at the university level up a notch. And then being able to see the TAG conference come to life, you know, when, when National Endowment of the Arts provided funding for the NCCU Teaching Artist Certificate Program, they said, we want to focus on your professional development elements of that, of that certificate program. And they were really surprised about the professional the scarcity of professional development that was formalized that had been brought to their attention. There were lots of places and lots of organizations doing it um, in, in shorter bursts of time, et cetera, et cetera. So it, I, I feel like that our um, knocking on their door help, you know, was a little pebble on the road to what ended up being the TAG conference that now, and, and the pandemic, hand in hand, created the, the awareness and understanding that it is a field that has been uh, ignored, you know, in a way. So the conference was really amazing on a lot of levels. Um, Kathleen, if you want to jump in there on any part of this, please do. And then we'll throw some questions to Bailey and Josh. Definitely. I was going to say, I, I really enjoyed kind of the sessions around kind of like what makes for a healthy ecosystem for the teaching artists and funding and exactly, Haleo, what you said. I think as a grant funder, it's, we're devastated when the school may have to pull out, you know, for one reason or another. And then the teaching artist is left you know, they had planned on it and then they're left with, you know, no finance and not paid or stipend. And so I think it gave me food for thought because this unfortunately does happen a lot, you know, you know, things change. And so how can I, as a funder, make sure we're protecting our teaching artists and giving them the support they need when, you know, oftentimes it's the school that's the primary applicant, but it made me just think we can be much more intentional and thorough and in those partnerships. And, and while the grant application isn't, I always say the grant application is not a contract, but I think we can put in some systems in there to protect both parties. And so that was really fascinating just to get to hear that funder's perspective. And then just to echo, I'm so excited more about regionally who to connect with. Um, 
because, you know, admittedly, I'm relatively new in my role. And so I'm always curious, you know, what others are doing, what are some strengths, and especially when we can think about similar climate, similar, you know, just like kind of environments that we're in to really get this work going. But without a doubt, I just think teaching artists are are such rock stars in the art field, and they really are what connect the arts to communities, to students. And I think just making sure that we, as funders of our arts and organizations, play a more supportive role. And that's very, very important. Awesome. So true. So true. I, too, uh, my heart throbs for teaching artists. Um, when I lived in New York and then when coming here, when I first, when we first started the Teaching Artist Certificate Program, we didn't see as many organizations and coalitions as we do now. Like we see a, a conversation that's happening. They, hi, Sheila Kerrigan um, of the League of North Carolina Teaching Artists. And there are several other organizations, Teaching Artists Connect, um, where the teaching artists are raising their hand and, 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 and choosing leadership of their colleagues and their peers um, and collaborative work in terms of advocacy. This is really important. So Bailey and Josh, this is for you. Seeing that there was this national conference for you as a teaching artist and, you know, and, and, and being able to go and listen to the breadth of information across the United States in terms of teaching artists. And then knowing that, knowing and the, and the organizations uh, in our area that have started to pop up and are working together on your behalf. What does that feel like? Tell me, uh, what did you think when you found out about the conference and then after you attended all three days and then thinking about yourself now going forward, right? Because th that was the name of the, the conference, uh, our shared future, learning together, listening together and moving forward. What do you feel, what are you feeling? You have to um, yourself, Bailey. Oh, Josh, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> uh, were you going to go, Bailey? Okay. Go. Okay. Um, so I feel, um, I feel the support. I mean, you know, like I think someone mentioned earlier that it's a very lonely profession, and it really is. Um, you know, there was a time when, like, I was looking for jobs earlier this year. And I was spending a lot of time at home by myself. And it was like, I just need like a place to go where I can talk to people who know what I'm dealing with. And that's when I discovered Teaching Artists Guild. Um, and I immediately signed up to Slack. And it was like helpful just to see other people <laughs> kind of doing something similar to what I'm doing. And it was like, it made me feel not as alone. Um, and yeah, so this conference and um, everything you do, Dr. Hammonds, um, really helps me feel supported um, and hopeful. Um, and like I have some resources I can tap into now that uh, can really help me along. So thank you all for that. Tell me more about Tag Slack, Josh. Um, so uh, if, if you don't, Slack is kind of like, uh, for me, it's sort of like Facebook um, for various groups and organizations. Um, a lot of people use it for work, but there's other groups on there like Teaching Artists Guild. Um, but yeah, it's it's like um, just a way to communicate with people, um, post messages, pictures, information. Awesome. And uh, Halea just put that in the in the um, in the chat for everyone who's on board and listening. Awesome, thank you, Josh Bailey. What about you? Sorry, I keep forgetting I'm on mute. <laughs> I feel enthused when I heard about it. I was ecstatic, especially during the pandemic where we may feel isolated. It's the way that we connect with people who are like minded, and we can continue to blossom and flourish. And we can reimagine what we already know because we know the future of arts is bright. The arts play a profound role in fueling our creative, our creative social and economic engines. 
And so, you know, taking something ordinary and making it extraordinary. I learned so much. I just want to read all of my notes. <laughs> um, but I definitely helped me to be more innovative in my approach. Awesome. Thank you for that, Bailey. I, for me, one of the things I took away because I spoke on the panel about being a cultural culture bearer and social activism and social justice married with the work that teaching artists do. And there was a question that really hit, uh, it was like a live wire, Halea, that whole question about credentialing. Should you have credential? Should there be credentialing in, in the teaching artist field? Should there, this is, this is something that really shocked me um, that people were, some people were vehemently against credentialing, that they thought training was good, but credentials, they had a lot of different things and feelings about credentials. So I'm gonna throw this first to Bailey and Josh, and then I'd love for you to jump in there, Halea and Kathleen. What do you feel about uh, having gone through a certificate program, the work you did before going through the certificate program as an artist, and then afterwards. Um, what do you feel about the need or use or non-use or lack of, or should, should other people have, should we do credentialing or, you know, in the teaching artist field? I feel that I have a stronger foundation after going through the teaching artist certificate program. Although I did teach before going into the program, it definitely helped elucidate my teaching modalities and my style and giving it more shape. It was quite uh, abstract, but now it's more defined after going through the class, um, different classes, different approaches to teaching where in many cases, the student is able to teach. And when a student does that, you know, teach, a student can't teach something they don't know. So when the roles are switched, you know, it really allows me to really sit back and see have I done my job effectively. And, and just different, different approaches that I had never been introduced to and how to make it cumulative. So starting with a basic principle and then building such as bricks to make it easier for us to transition into more difficult concepts. Thank you, Josh. Um, well, I'm obviously biased, you know, as a graduate of the teaching our certificate program, but um, I, I think it's okay. I mean, uh, I think you mentioned Dr. Hammonds about, you know, Central is not claiming to be the cert, you know, certification of teaching artists. And I think, you know, I, I learned that very early on in, in interacting with the program. Um, and, you know, I think um, employers are, can be intelligent and they can look at a credential and they can realize that that's not the end all be all. And, you know, ultimately they have to get to know the person to find out if they're a good fit, just like any other job. So I think it's fine. I think, you know, it, it can help some people get in the door and hopefully it will not stop other people from also getting in the door. Um, I mean, that's kind of like a larger societal issue we have um, that I don't think we're gonna solve by not having a teaching artist credential. Interesting, thank you. Halea. Um, I've been part of this conversation for a long time actually around um, teaching artist credentials. And um, I, t I tend to personally fall on the end of not wanting one and here's why. And here's where I think maybe the conversation <laughs> that, um, that you're referencing to, there was a wild conversation happening in the chat during your panel. Um, and um, much of the resistance I think to something um, like a teaching artist credential comes around um, putting up more access barriers to a field that is quite open. Um, I just dropped what we call the teaching artist manifesto into the chat. Um, 
this is part of the reason why it's really hard to have any conversations around the field because our field is very wide. It's very diverse, not just in art forms, um, but in the spaces that we work. Not everybody who is a teaching artist even uses the label teaching artists or agrees with the label teaching artist. You know, that was a long conversation um, at TAG and at Association of Teaching Artists before that. And as a conversation that happens with the International Teaching Artists Collaborative also, um, uh, is this even the right term to use? Um, we work in so many different settings. Um, just because I work in a school, many people who are teaching us only work at community centers, only work in participatory settings, only work with senior citizens, only work with young people, right? It, but it's all sort of held under the same umbrella, right? So I think when we, we have this conversation about certification, it's like, well, what are we teaching for them? Like, what are we certifying for them? It's not the same as giving a K-12 teacher certification where we do know what the confines of that work is, right? Teaching artistry is just too wide. And so I think that's where we start to get people getting worried. Um, and then I think we also, we have a, we have a long history of, um, preventing people from getting into certain industries too in this country. And so if we start to put up walls where we say, you know, you can only be a teaching artist if you've got, if you have if this credential, right? What does that mean for people who have been doing the work for 20 years already, right? Um, one of the conversations that we've had um, at TAG over the years was this, um, the, the California um, Department of Education wanted there to be some sort of vetting process for putting teaching artists into schools, right? And I do understand that. And many arts councils have a vetting process to get on their roster anyway. Um, and so this idea of digital badging came about for, well, we're not saying you have to go get a master's degree. We're not saying that you have to get some sort of a certification, but how do we know um, where, um, you know, where people have gained their experience. And could you get a digital badge for just saying, I've been doing it for 20 years, thank you very much. <laughs> that's my experience, that's my training. Um, or um, I was mentored for this person for five years and it was an informal mentorship. And how does that sort of show up in digital badging? Um, I think it's a really complicated question um, because even, and, I, and I think about this from the administrative standpoint too, right? Even if I can see you might have a digital badge from X, Y, or Z, or a teaching artist certificate from A, B, or C, from a hiring standpoint, I still am going to see, want to see you teach, and I'm still going to want to have you go through my training. Because if I'm hiring you for my program, I want to know that you can teach through my pedagogy. Um, and when I say my, I mean from the organization's standpoint's pedagogy and from the organization's um, lens. And you might be super qualified at what you do and still not be a right fit for that organization. And seeing a certificate on your resume actually still doesn't show me or teach me that, right? Watching you teach in the classroom is what shows me that. Um, so that's a, little, that's a little bit on a very, very long, complicated question. But I, I, I do think that the reason people get agitated about it is because they start to think that they will be excluded from opportunities and jobs. Thank you, Halea. Kathleen. Yeah, well, on the opportunities and jobs front, I think I know, you know, the North Carolina Arts Council, we were really excited to partner with North Carolina Central University's Teaching Arts Certificate Program. And this started, this partnership started kind of right in the midst of the pandemic. Because I think we were trying to think how, um, how could we make sure artists could get connected with the field of teaching artistry? And maybe this is a, an area they would like to pursue. I 100% agree that teaching artists are artists, not all artists are teaching artists. And so I think we were through our partnership with Lenora and the Teaching Arts Certificate Program, we wanted to provide accessible avenues, pathways for artists to explore this field. And I think what's the beauty of this program is it not only provides, you know, training for in-school residencies, but also working with, you know, maybe healthcare settings or social services. I think we were just really excited to partner as well as just show the, I think, as everyone said, it's very broad, right? And there's so many audiences you can work with. So for us, we were really wanting to make sure 
there may be some fantastic artists that are out there, but haven't had this, these foundational trainings and support to pursue a field in teaching artistry. And we wanted to, our partnership we saw as a way of opening these doors and promoting more access and promoting more diversity in the field of teaching artistry in the state. Thank you, Kathleen. And then you have the A plus schools program, right? So can yes. you talk about that and how that yes. helps to bridge teaching artists into settings and you know addressing the conversations that have come up from um, the the conference, the, our shared future conference, and some of the points that Halea was just speaking about. Yes, definitely. The, our A plus schools network um, is they're kind of they're my teammates here at the North Carolina Arts Council. But exactly, they have what's called a fellowship program. And so we actively recruit teaching artists to participate um, and provide training to its fellows. And those A-plus fellows aren't necessarily going into the schools to train the students, but they're there to train the teachers. They're there to train the trainers. So I think that's such an important part. And it also in further promotes and enhances value of the field of teaching artistry. Um, so I think exactly A plus schools is, is really great. And then I know we mentioned also the roster to roster to not to roster. We currently don't, <laughs> we currently don't have a roster. I think a, a major takeaway I get is, um, I'm constantly on the phone with libraries or schools, um, you know, even working with schools who the primary arts grant context, actually the science teacher. I mean, it is, so I think they're just wanting some sort of resource or way to ensure that they're bringing in strong artists to their schools. So I do think, um, you know, I'm in my own journey of like figuring out the roster piece as well, because I don't want to exclude people, but I know it's such a valuable resource and, I, and I'm appreciative of our, our, you know, community partners such as libraries and schools and social services who generally want to bring in strong artists into their, you know, into their spaces or to connect with their community. So I, I think it's something, honestly, still kind of figuring it out <laughs> um, as we go. But everything that everyone mentioned, you don't want to be in excluding anybody, but I do think it helps for those who don't practice, you know, who aren't artists themselves. How do they, they know that the work, um, you know, will be meaningful and have a, a fantastic impact, you know, and not a negative. I think that's my biggest concern. I always don't want to make sure we don't bring in and create a negative experience or something that we're funding. So we care a lot about whether it's the credentials or experience. Um, and while we still also wanna promote it and, and encourage new recruitment to the field, I do think we play a role here at the Arts Council to make sure that the teaching artists are generally a great fit as, as Haleya was saying for that program. For instance, for a arts and healthcare program, I would like to make sure that that teaching artist has some experience or training working in an arts, you know, in a healthcare setting, because it's just a different skill set than working in a school. Exactly. I think it's so interesting, too, that um, someone could be a teaching artist with an organization for 20 years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years for the same organization. And um, what, how do you, when the, when, when that crop of teaching artists retire, what happens to that region? And so regionally, we want to think about and the support that our teaching artists have in our region. Thank you again, Sheila. Southeast Center for Arts Integration based in North Carolina offers professional development to teachers and teaching artists on arts integration. So it was so different when I was in, lived in different bigger Northern cities to learn about what, what the regional opportunities were. Your asset map, Halea, gives an opportunity for the teaching artists across the country to know, to place themselves within the context of teaching artists across the country and to see where the pockets of teaching artists are and, and don't exist uh, or don't know about the asset map yet. And so um, I hope Bailey and Josh are on the asset map right now. I think, I think Josh mentioned that he is. But in terms, our next question is, how do you think the teaching artists in North Carolina and in the Southeast region are impacted by the conference? The topics, the issues, the outcomes of the discussions. And this may seem like a repeat of the former question, what were your big takeaways? But this is you thinking about your peers, not only thinking about you, where you are as a teaching artist, but someone that you wanna encourage that you know is a great artist who never thought about being a teaching artist. How would you tell them about TAG and or the conference 
for the region that you're in right now? Josh or Bailey, you can go first. That's a, a big question. Um, this, I feel like this field is, you really have to, for me at least, this is like a very long process getting into this field, you know? Um, and you really have to be committed to it if you want to do it. And this is just my experience. Um, so I don't, I mean, I can't even think of anybody that I would like, well, okay, the longer I think about it, the more I'm thinking of people. <laughs> um, yeah, I could think of some people I could recommend this to. Um, I mean, I think, I don't know, regionally, uh, you know, there's, Now, and I'll tag something onto that question as you're thinking of that response. When you were listening to the sessions in the conference, what, what may have jumped out at you like, oh, well, that's not in my area. Or, wow, they do that over in Seattle? Oh, that's happening in Georgia? Oh, that's happening in New York? I never even knew that existed, that people could do that. Yeah, um, well, definitely the pay is different, you know, outside of a big city, we can expect less pay here. Um, and I think one cool thing I heard about was the artist housing. Um, I hadn't heard of that before. Uh, that's like, uh, for, I guess, senior artists who want to live in community with each other. Um, so that seems like a cool idea. Um, I think those were the main things. Great, thank you. Yeah, living in, in housing with other teacher, with other artists is really an incredible experience. For a while in New York, I lived at West Beth and it was, it's an amazing building in the West Village with hundreds of artists of all disciplines. And it was also the home on the first floor of the Merce Cunningham Dance um, Company. So that can be, I don't know of any community here in this region that has that, uh, that affords artists a place to live, you know, in one big housing complex or something. So yeah, that's one thing too, I agree. Bailey. Yes, one thing that stood out to me was the alphabet rockers. I think they were located in California, but how they make music that makes change and reading some of my notes, it says being anti-racist is a long, is a lifelong, being anti-racist is a lifelong learning process. Um, it can be joyful, but even in complicated circumstances, both when we are alone and when we are in community learning from each other, alphabet rockers meet parents and educators wherever their current work lands on the spectrum of awareness. And the ultimate aim is fostering brave conversation with kids designed to interrupt racism and stand up for one another. And their motto is there's no tough topic we can't embrace without love. And they said they don't throw shade, but they throw shine on people in the community. So I never heard about uh, this form of raising awareness. I love it. It's awesome. And, and just thinking about my experience as a whole. It was great just to connect and hear how people are, are connecting and sharing what they know with each other. It just makes me think back on my last project that I did in the Teaching Artist Certification Program and just the, the residency that I had to do and understanding the core concepts that were learned that I learned through the Teaching Artist Certification classes, including the round the round robin rally structure, the Kagan structure. That was awesome. Learning about the Kagan structure, um, Bloom's taxonomy, and remembering, understanding, applying, evaluating, and creating, and making sure that my lessons plans were meeting the North Carolina state standards. So it was just nice to see the conglomerate of, of people on the spectrum and 
I'm excited to continue to put what I learned into practice. I promise I didn't pay her to say that. <laughs> Thank you, Bailey. Yes, those are very interesting points. Halea, so the, the asset map and the differences in teaching artists across regions, what have you learned as a result of the conference, you know, and in your experience, what, what's jumping out at you that you can share with us? Um, I think a, a big learning curve for us over the past year is we've made a larger push to get more people on the map um, and particularly more people on the map outside of major cities. Um, it's just the reality that, that teaching artists outside of major cities really are mostly working with arts councils or with schools individually. And that idea around contract negotiations and negotiating for your, your own pay um, is not something that we um, we have done a lot of work on before because just frankly, most of the people that have been around in TAG have worked in cities where the model really more is teaching artists work as employees for hiring organizations or museums or cultural institutions. Um, and the you know negotiating that you have to do is really with that organization, right? Um, and that's really different than uh, maybe owning your own LLC and um, um, a, a, you know being hired by a school, right? Um, so I, I think that's you know something we are thinking about as we move um, you know into thinking about professional development moving forward. Our, our past professional developments have been a lot more around like how do you do your taxes as a freelancer? Um, how do you save for retirement as a freelancer? And now I think we need to um, up that conversation into how do you negotiate for yourself when you're an independent contractor? Um, that has been a big, big learning curve for me. Um, and then I think our, our, um, our biggest goal really is just to find all of the different avenues that people can find each other, right? So, um, you know, Josh was mentioning the Slack before. Um, Slack really like came about because that's like a, that's a relic of Yahoo groups. I know some of you on the call aren't even old enough to remember what that was, but back in the olden days of the internet, we had these things called Yahoo listservs. Um, and ATA, Association of Teaching Artists, had one. And it really became, um, it just grew and blossomed as a, as a grassroot network of teaching artists supporting other teaching artists. You could send an email or post onto that group. I'm having trouble with X, Y, and Z. Who can help me write this lesson plan? Here's a job opportunity in upstate New York. You know, um, I want to make sure everybody knows about it. But when Yahoo, you know, changed over, the, the, um, the groups went away. We wanted to find a way for that to, to continue on that wasn't just social media, because if you don't have the algorithm set perfectly for everybody's settings, you know, we have 10,000 followers on Facebook, but I'm, I'm sure that not everybody sees every post that we make, right? Um, and how can we make it sort of more, um, you know, crowdsourced? And so that's really where the Slack came about. So there's different channels that people can join. There's ones about pay equity. I'd love for one to start about contract negotiations in, um, in, in rural and suburban networks. Um, there's general postings, there's job postings, et cetera, et cetera. But we'd love to see more, more regional events happening there. But how can we connect people to each other to be able to um, answer those those questions and and support each other out there because i know if i had an opportunity to connect with someone when i was 21 and thinking that this is what i wanted to do but not knowing what the name of it was and not really understanding how i could have done it i probably would have wasted a lot less time trying to have a commercial acting career and just gotten into this a little bit sooner right <laughs> That's so funny, exactly. I mean, I was thinking as, as a performer, often when I'm booked for a concert, I'm asked to do um, a masterclass or a talk back after the performance. That's the seedling that introduced me, introduced me to, well, that's part of the task. Those are part of the tasks that a teaching artist does. So I was doing concerts and master classes attached to the concert, pricing for those activities long before I knew that those are things teaching artists do. 
in the auditorium performances. Because when I start, when I was working for young audiences in New York, that's we have so many concomitant kinds of uh, roads, Halea. Um, they they trained you on how to design an auditorium performance because singing and performing to 300 kids in an auditorium or a thousand kids in Carnegie Hall is very different from 25 senior citizens at, at a residence you know, center. How to design an auditorium performance and how to design a you know, several week residency are two different animals. But if I had known when I was getting my music degree at Berkeley, there were no classes on being a teaching artist. There was no conversation from my professors about being a teaching artist, right? So now I talk to all of the dance majors, the, the music majors, the art majors, the, the, the theater majors. Did you know there was something called being a teaching artist? And 99% of them go, no, no. And that, that's the little, that, that's where our next teaching artist generations could be accessed from. But, you know, what do you, what do, what do we see in terms of the conference and what you've learned already in your vast experience, Halea? What do we see as a place to go and find and cultivate and develop teaching artists? Because a lot of the conversations about all the things we heard or from people who are established and veterans. But who, who's talking about the people who don't even know that they don't even know yet? Higher Ed is a great place. Um, um, TAG has been involved with the arts education partnerships, higher education, arts education. It's a long acronym, I can't remember, um, <laughs> group for a while, um, talking about how we had those conversations earlier on. And I even, you know, way back when, when I was in college, I did have access to a theater for young audiences class. Um, and I did have the opportunity to go and teach workshops with our partner schools when I was an undergrad. And I still graduated and didn't know what the term teaching artist was, you know? Um, so it's, it's yes and. Um, Getting into higher education in the arts degree programs and letting people know that this is another revenue stream that they have as an artist, I think is huge. Um, I fell into it exactly in the same way that you did. I was doing touring shows to assemblies and they said, can you do a pre workshop before? And I was like, I, I guess, yeah, sure. I can teach, <laughs> you know, fell on my face a few times and then sort of realized, oh, this is really fun. This is why I love performing for young people so much because I just love young people so much. Um, and, um, you know, happen to fall into mentorships that way. But so I think higher ed is one place, letting people know in those theater training programs, those music training programs, um, that teaching artistry is a thing. Um, I was a professor at the new school. They have an entire required class for all of their BFAs where they have to go and mentor um, like and shadow as part of their like intern hours. They shadow a program. I have That's how I ended up teaching at the new school is somebody reached out to me and said, can I shadow in your program, you know, in your your theater program? And I said, sure. Where are you going to school that's teaching you this? I don't want to teach there. Um, and, um, and then I think the other great place is to pull the young people from our programs, right? That's the time to tell people when you're teaching a middle and a high school class to say like, you know, you can do this, right? I'm always talking about in the classes, I'm, I'm not just training the next generation of professional actors, I'm training the next generation of creative thinkers um, and people who are going to be in the Google boardrooms doing an interactive activity <laughs> and getting people to think in a different way than in spreadsheets, right? Um, so that's the next generation too. How can we build assistant models and mentorship models for the young people coming out of our programs and saying, you know, the only pathway is not just to create an arts portfolio and go into a BFA. That's a lovely, amazing way to do it. I did that too. And, you know, you could do something else. You could, you could mentor with us and, and go to community college and, and, and teach with us. It's amazing. Um, and Kathleen, Bailey, Josh, if you want to jump in on, on any of these threads, uh, I think that Halea is such a rich resource for us, for teaching artists in our region, because she has that 30,000 foot view 
right? And we may be in a silo called North Carolina, but she has a viewpoint um, and aspects of it. And so I keep going to you, Haleya, to say, and what do you think about this? So uh, there was an opportunity once for me to work with um, Duke, Duke Corporate Education. And they asked me to form a, form a jazz experience for you know, of several hundred CEOs that were coming to a conference. And I was like, um, I was completely intimidated at first, but that's a teaching artist work. Do you have teaching artists that are doing corporate education? And, and do, does, does that show up as something that TAG is focused on or working on? That you don't have to answer that right away, but Bailey, Josh, Kathleen, just interrupt me <laughs> so I don't start just asking Haleya a bunch of TAG questions. Um, and I don't mean to leave anyone out here. Again, we're working to bring about, talk about, debrief on the our shared future, listening together and moving forward. So if there's something I haven't touched on, Bailey and Josh, I know you attended all three days. Please jump in there. I was just going to say, um, Lenore, that's a great point. You know, we're hearing a lot of um, how to partner outside of the arts field, it, it, everything that's been saying. So I think we here at the Arts Council are trying to figure out more ways, how can we serve as a bridge? And, you know, and where does it make sense? Where does it not? You know, I think it's a lot of work kind of in this like growing pains maybe moment with that. I think the Slack idea of um, teaching artistry in like rural communities would be fabulous. I would love to learn more of that. You know, North Carolina, 80 out of our 100 counties are rural. And so um, how, you know, my role is how can I make sure we're connecting with teaching artists in these counties or regions? Um, admittedly, I know in the past, our roster's probably been very triangle heavy, you know, or triad heavy. So I'm, I'm wanting to learn how I, similar, like how can we get to know everyone who's out there which does, I did have a quick question with regards to the asset map. map. Um, how, you know, for anyone who wasn't at the conference, how could a teaching artist like in North Carolina, if they wanted to join the map, how, how is it, how is it to be done? <laughs> just create a profile. Yeah, just um, go to that link, um, the map, create a profile for the website. Um, and it's, it's all free. Just make sure you check the like location visible box. A lot of people sign up and they don't check that box and you don't show up on it if you don't check location visible. I love that. Okay, Bailey or Josh, tell me, you know, what did we not talk about yet from the Our Shared Future conference that, uh, you know, stayed with you that was a moment in your heart and spirit and soul after you left? Do, 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 um, the, the woman from Hawaii was, um, really powerful and she touched on so many aspects of teaching artistry and activism. I thought that was really cool that y'all were able to include her, um, and I appreciated that. Um, it was very powerful. And uh, I learned things about Hawaii I never knew. Um, yeah. Thanks, Josh. I think that whole activism thread was really uh, unique because that's for me is new in terms of the teaching artists that I knew. Um, uh, when I was in the in the trenches as a teaching artist, primarily, so it's um, that's that people are marrying social activism as teaching artists. We have one of our alums, um, Angel Dozier, who will be one of our guests in the May seventeenth um, Teaching Artist Tuesdays. That started a whole leadership program, community leaders. She's taking community leaders who are um, at risk and training them to be in the forefront through a teaching artist model in their neighborhoods uh, in Durham, which is, has a lot of different layers of very volatile neighborhoods. And I was floored by her focus on social activism and using the teaching artist 
um, scaffolding to train them. So yeah, the, so the, the woman from Hawaii, she was powerful. I think that was really like, oh, go ahead, Bailey. Okay, uh, I, I appreciate the Miss Marika from Quebec, Canada, uh, and just discussing the power, looking at my notes, the power of regional cultural networking to amplify access and welcoming citizens throughout a region into art centers and arts practices, networking structures, amplifying and spreading artistic work, and just using art to raise awareness about social issues in society and how they are relevant, especially amidst the pandemic, and just how art in general can be a vector of development um, in our local communities, and how art organizations around the world are just looking for ways to build bridges and collaborate with members of the community that they're a part of. That's one I missed. Thank you. And I was just thinking that, Halea, I should find the ITAC, um, uh, the ITAC link. Will you tell us about uh, ITAC? Are you going to Oslo? I'm thinking of going to Oslo in September. Yeah, we are. So TAG and Lincoln Center are um, combined. We are the United States hub for ITAC. So ITAC stands for the International Teaching Artist um, Collaborative. Before that, it stood for the International Teaching Artist Conference. Um, this will be the sixth one that they've ever held. They happen every other year. So it's been happening for about 12 years. Um, I had the privilege of going to ITAC4 when it was in New York, um, and it was a uh, life-changing experience for me to be in a room feel full of all people who do what I do. I think my conference experiences before that were always being one of a handful of teaching artists there, um, and this, uh, this really flips the table, and that was, that was our goal with our shared future as well. Um, so... Um, the International Teaching Artists Collaborative has um, hubs in various countries around the world. They have um, really been building that over the past four years um, to build these hubs. Um, and then they sort of alternate where things are hosted. Um, since COVID, even before COVID though, actually, they um, have always done a really great job of trying to make um, a sessions accessible. So um, this year it will be a, a hybrid um, conference. So you can um, apply to be a delegate to go in person to Oslo. Those applications are open now if you want to be an in-person delegate. Um, and there is some funding that is available for scholarships for that. Um, I would just encourage you all to ask people like the North Carolina Arts Council and um, your hiring organizations to perhaps fund you also. Um, I just wrote a grant today to send some of our arts core teaching artists there. I know it's a pricey ticket from the West Coast to get to Norway. But you can also participate digitally. So you can apply to be a digital delegate also. It's only a 20 euro fee to do that. Um, and many of the sessions um, and the keynote speeches will be um, will be um, streamed live that way. I'm, I'm, I'm not on the planning committee, so I can't tell you any more details besides that, but, um, but we love ITAC. I think it's a really, really valuable experience to hear what's happening in other countries. I learned so much um, when I went to the one in New York. Um, I met teaching artists you know, from all over the world um, and really got a sense of the various kinds of participatory work that's happening. So I encourage you to at least get on their email list and go to some of their, um, their think tanks. I know that Sheila left, but Sheila, I think, has hosted one of the, the think tanks before. Um, and you can get little bits of money to, to host your own, too. So if you have an idea. Yeah, I better. Yeah, Halea, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, we do have something called the Artist Support Grant here with the North Carolina Arts Council. And it can certainly go to fund PD, typically arts professional development, typically um, to get any travel cost or anything like that related to a conference, typically it's, you need to be presenting or somehow part of the planning process. However, it could certainly cover like the virtual fees or any like pre-session things that may be happening as well. So our support grant is a new grant category we created during the pandemic and continue to offer it. And we pretty much to facilitate it, we directly fund local arts councils. So you would connect with your local arts council that usually the application opens in 
um, this summer. But I'm also, feel free, I'll put my email in there. Feel free to email me. I can send you more information about that directly. And I just also wanted to mention one other PD opportunity that may be of interest for um, teaching artists here in North Carolina or regionally, the Kennedy Center's um, annual Arts and Accessibility Lead Conference will be here in Raleigh. And I know that they are offering, you know, great um, sessions around teaching artistry as well. So um, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me as well. There are some funding opportunities we are offering for that conference that's happening here in state. So don't hesitate. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, don't ever hesitate to reach out about any possibility for funding and professional development. I think a lot of times I just want to make sure artists are aware of some of the resources we have here to offer at the Arts Council. Thank you. Kathleen, how should they reach out to you? I'll put my email right here in the chat box. Awesome. I think I, I, I didn't think about presenting at ITAC in Oslo, but I think I will to see if I could attend as a delegate. Um, if is attending as a delegate the same thing as asking to present? The um, application period for submitting um, presentations has already closed, but the way that they do it, it's, so it's not sort of like a first come first serve, just register. You, they have people apply to be delegates so that they make sure that they have a geographic diversity um, of teaching artists from around the world. So oh, you apply to be a delegate to, to attend the conference. And I'm not sure what the total number is, but you can apply to be either a virtual or an in-person delegate. Okay, got it. We're rounding down our conversation now. So we have really talked about a lot of things. If I could try to sum up everything that we've talk, been talking about over this last hour, uh, we discussed just the basic overview of uh, what the conference sessions had over the three days, that it was April 5th through the 7th. It was the first national conference that was collaboratively presented by Teaching Artists Guild. And the Teaching Artists Guild is a new conglomeration of the Association of Teaching Artists that was based in New York and the Teaching Artists Guild that was based in California, correct, California? Um, I, I knew of both organizations separately so that they came together and assumed the name of the Teaching Artists Guild. Um, in tandem with the National Endowment of the Arts, the National Department of Education, the Arts Education Partnership, and the Hewlett Foundation, go Hewlett for jumping in there uh, as a private foundation, um, and supporting professional development and awareness about the teaching artist field comprised in the three-day event, Our Shared Future, A New Landscape for Teaching Artists. This was just an amazing event. And it's almost, um, it, it, how long can we still watch those sessions? If you registered and missed some of it, Halea. Well, we leaned into the ephemeral um, nature of the arts and did not record anything. So um, that was, was for a few number of reasons. My experience is every time we record things, no one watches it afterwards. Um, and so what we opted to do instead was we, um, we scrolled away $5,000 of our budget to pay teaching artist reporters um, and also to have that graphic note taker. Um, so some of those are already starting to come out. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll continue to email those out in our newsletter um, and post them to our blog. Um, and they are varied. There's going to be some podcasts. I know there's a couple of TikTok series that are coming out. There was like a, a graphic blog that was already posted. Um, some people are writing songs um, uh, with their takeaways and reflections because we thought that that would drive the conversation more than posting an hour long YouTube. Um, uh, just because uh, so many of our sessions um, were, were pretty heavy and deep topics too. Um, and I think there was like um, great conversations happening in the chat too. So we wanted a way for people to continue on the conversation. So keep an eye out for those. Some of them are already being posted to our social media. If you don't already follow us, please do. Um, and um, and uh, you can also go to our, our, our tag YouTube, I'll pull that up, and our past PDs that have been shorter than five hour long conferences over three days, which are a little bit easier to upload to YouTube. Um, those, those live on in perpetuity, and I will, I will drop that link on too. Awesome, thank you so much. 
Do you have a blog, Kalea, for the Teaching Artist Guild? Okay, if you would give us those links in the chat, that'd be so great. Um, Kathleen, there's a blog for the North Carolina Arts Council now I've been seeing, right? Yes, let me get, I'll put it in the chat as well. But yeah, we, um, we have a fantastic new content director, Kaisha Jennings, and we have a blog out. I believe we also are gonna be launching a few other um, kind of stories to make sure we're, we're sharing the incredible and vibrant arts community here in North Carolina and celebrating our teaching artists. We'll also be, um, oh, thanks Eileen. <laughs> and Eileen is also part of this wonderful marketing team. We're also gonna be, um, and I'll probably share it more at the next Teaching Artists Tuesday, but I'll also happy to provide an update about some upcoming teaching artists opportunities and grants um, for looking in the year ahead as well. Awesomeness. Okay, Bailey, can you tell us as a result of the conference, what's new, what's, what's your forward moving forward? What is your moving forward as a result of the conference? You'll have to unmute yourself, darling. Sorry. Continuing to use the resources that I was exposed to and connecting with people, I connected with people uh, through Facebook. Uh, of course, using Facebook to continue to educate myself and my own development as well. And you're going to be doing a summer residency, aren't you? With Yes, I'll be doing a summer residency uh, with the North Carolina Arts Council uh, and I'm super excited. We are going to do the theme of Ukraine. And so I have the music department. And so I'll be for a whole week, I'll be with students and we'll be examining music from Ukraine, instruments that are specific to Ukraine uh, some composers uh, from Ukraine and just kind of exposing people to the different aspects of everything about music um, in Ukraine. So I'm super excited about that coming into fruition. Durham Arts Council or North Carolina Arts Council? I mean, Durham Arts Council, sorry, <laughs> Durham Arts Council. <laughs> the Durham Arts Council, yes. Okay, thank you. Congratulations on that. So excited for you. And Josh, what is your moving forward as a result of the conference? Uh, my big thing is just keep on going. Um, you know, like I said before, this is an ongoing process for me. I get discouraged. I go through times when I'm not doing it as much, and then I get inspired. And this was one of those times when I get inspired. So I've already written a description for a new class I want to teach. And I'm working on more up here and uh, going to get those out into the world and see if I can get some bites on them. Well, definitely send them my way. I love to brag about the alums and show the current students um, what you all are up to. And especially I, every time I get a new crop, a new cohort, they come up with a new way to work and serve as a teaching artist. So one student decides, decided I was gonna, she's going to get her master's degree in music therapy as a result of being through our certificate program because it made her realize and understand she really loves the healing and social community aspect of being a teaching artist. And she came in as a vocal performance major. So cool. So even as administrators, Kathleen and Halea, you have a moving forward too. What is your moving forward, please? Can you share that with us? Um, my moving forward is uh, it's twofold. We're in a big fundraising push for TAG right now to be able to do more, trying to build off of the conference um, so that, um, there are more opportunities um, 
for um, to pay teaching artists to, to do work. So I want to invite everyone that blog insight insight is our teaching artist blog. That's all teaching artist voices. Um, we pay for people to write articles for that. So if you have an idea that you think would be useful for teaching artists to hear, um, please hit us up and let us know. We're always looking for new people to do that. Um, we also have a national advisory committee and I don't have anybody in North Carolina on that North national advisory committee. So I'm, I'm looking at you alums here. Um, we need some rep there on the NAC. Um, that again um, is a stipended work. Um, if you host a regional event, something like this, you can get paid to do that. You can get paid um, to adjudicate the tag awards. You can get paid to um, edit a, um, a copy of the Insight Insight. There's all sorts of different um, things. I'll post some, some information there. So bringing more people into the field, we are um, admittedly have been, um, you know, pretty coastal. Um, and, and when I say coastal, I mean like, you know, Northeast and North and California, basically, um, in the NAC, and we're we're trying to change that. We've done a lot of work in the past year, and we are hoping to build on the conference towards that. So that's my job, and finding my replacement. That we we um we did um, a huge strategic plan when we merged, and the idea really is that nobody is in my job for longer than three years. That we have rotating leadership that comes up from the national advisory committee, so that whoever um, you know is at the helm of of TAG is moving ge geographically, has different artistic representation, has different lived experiences. So um, come and join us and and have my job and come and sit on this panel in two years. I would love to, <laughs> to see new faces um, leading this work. The more, the more that we have together, um, we are always stronger in that work. Beautiful, that's inspiring. Calling all Baileys, calling all Joshes. <laughs> okay, Kathleen, what's your moving forward? Yes. So I feel like this whole year, um, I've, I've called it like my listening and learning year, right? So I've been wanting to just make sure I'm getting to get out in the field and connect with teaching artists. So please, like I said, I, I mean it. I, I love connecting with teaching artists and learning about their work. I think um, we, for the past two years, the Arts Council have been in pandemic response mode. And I'm, I, and while we're still in this phase of in a pandemic still and living and working in a pandemic, I am excited to see some kind of light at the end of the tunnel to bring back our project grants. Because to me, that means that's funding going directly to our teaching artists. And I can honestly say we are always happy to see a majority of the grant funds going to pay the teaching artists for a project. So I think what I'm in a place now is listening, learning, both from teaching artists as well as from the organizations, remote partnerships, and how can I serve as a bridge? How can I make sure we put in some support systems and resources, circling back to some of these earlier topics discussed in the webinar, um, just to make sure teaching artists feel supported in the state. And, it, and it's really helpful to hear like this um, interest and need for peer networking. You know, I know teaching artists Tuesdays is just one step, but I think there's a lot of, I'm excited to kind of connect with Lenora and brainstorm a little bit more about this further and how we can push the envelope and, and get more teaching artists in our networks. So I'm, I'm excited to soak it all up. <laughs> I'm not trying to be over, over positive because I know these are such challenging times, but I think um, I'm also feeling hopeful as well going forward. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm invigorated by your excitement and enthusiasm, Kathleen. I so appreciate you because sometimes I'm like, Teaching Artist Tuesdays is coming. Oh my God. <laughs> like this semester has been really challenging because I've had to, um, I've had to advise five thesis papers and capstone events for graduating graduate students and undergrad students. And I feel like the days are a blur. But even so, I'm still excited and invigorated by this conversation and teaching artists period for a couple of reasons. So we started this program in 2017 with just me and like a wing and a prayer. And now in 2022, finally my dean and the university is like, wow, I guess this is gonna stay. So, you know, they got me an admin and they wanna give us an office space and they wanna build the program. 
your deputy director, Kathleen, Dr. Tamara Brothers, wants to help us make a model, a scaffolding for um, other HBCUs, because in terms of cultural bearers and the conversation, you know, uh, Halea, that you help help um, to curate during during the conference, that there there's a lot of cultural richness that comes from the music and arts ecosystems that are at HBCUs that are not represented in the teaching artist field. And so you're talking about places where there can be a lot of cultivation. And this diversity not only is uh, from pe persons of color, but we, we at, at HBCUs, we have um, a lot of diverse population, right? Some people think, oh, it's only uh, people of color at HBCUs, it's not. And not only that, they have a lot of different um, multicultural backgrounds within their communities, whether they're Latinx, um, Indian, um, or combinations of Afro, the African diaspora, as well as people who um, are from other abilities and accessibilities and, and differentiations, you know, um, gender and sexual orientation, where the, the, um, the focus is on a type of, uh, at HBCUs, there's a type of um, ideal about culture. So no matter what cultural background you come from, that, that is part of the work and part of the um, ceremonies we do and, the, and things like that. And so it, it gives you a kind of a mindset uh, different from being in other environments. And that's a very important tapestry to bring to teaching artist work. Um, so I'm really excited that we'll be able to kind of build on the little pebble that has become a snowball and, and kind of turn a lot of that over because I'll be doing some additional uh, work in different areas. So my next move forward is to, to um, make sure that um, the understanding of what a certificate program is and is not in a university setting. I'm really listening to the fear about credentialing and making sure our messaging is about training and not rubber stamping anybody or omitting people because you know, higher ed, for some people, they're just against higher ed. But if you're in an academic situation, it takes away their organic element or nature, or you leave people out. There are people who are privileged to attend a university and, and people who can't, you know, are, are priced out of it. So um, those are important concerns to me. And this conference really, I was in my silo here, but the conference helped me, Halea, think about it differently as an administrator as a program director and, and developer. So thank you very much. Thank you, that's really great to hear. Um, and I, I agree, I mean, I think that we, um, we don't know what we don't know, right? And, and that's why it's important to get together and talk um, and hear different perspectives. I mean, I think um, I was in some of the breakout rooms with hiring organizations too, and I think, uh, there were some great conversations around, yeah, you know, we asked for to share this feedback, but like people don't really give it, or I think they're like scared to give it because their, their job is like kind of on the line. And how do we just like create a better lines of communication to make sure that we are meeting the needs? Like, I think we're meeting the needs, but I don't know. When's the last time I actually even asked, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, um, it can be it can be hard to make projections there when when you're not in open levels of communication and just hearing from different perspectives. So that's why um, I'm so appreciative of, of you all for hosting this and all of our other regional partners who hosted regional events too because it's it's so fantastic to hear what the needs are from from other communities, you know, so that we can make sure we're not just guessing. Thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to Kathleen to kind of head us out, I want to really thank Anthony Glenn and Eileen Chang for their work. They are the powerhouses behind the scenes to make sure that we can keep doing this work and keep these uh, webinars going. They seem to come up so much more fast, much faster than I, I know. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's here. Um, 
but without them making sure, Eileen makes sure that everything looks amazing in our marketing and that it's right there. Eileen, I cannot thank you enough for having a nice snack size bite of all the text already. And I just have to copy and paste and put it in Twitter and copy and paste and put it in Instagram. Like I, I wanna hire you for my own <laughs> work as an artist to do that same thing. So thank you so much. And Anthony, thank you. I know your hands are full and you are always um, balancing many, many for the entire campus of 8,000 some people of faculty and students. And you are kind of a lone ranger in many ways. Um, and then you find time for us. And I really, really appreciate you, Anthony. And so um, my hat's off to you. Halea, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your generosity, for supporting our teaching artists, our regional teaching artists, uh, to um, be able to come on today. Um, and also thanks to Katie Fisher. No, Katie Rainey, right? That's your, your co-director. Do I have her name right? Yes, okay. Yes, Katie Rainey, yeah. Yes, Katie Rainey. Thank you so much, Katie Rainey. Uh, in absentia, but we, we appreciate and love you too. Uh, so I'm going to just throw it back to Kathleen um, and thank you very much for joining us. Yes, I just want to echo my, our, you know, my thanks and appreciation for everybody for joining us today. I always learn so much from these sessions. So thank you for your time and consideration. And yes, Eileen and Anthony, we could not do this without you. So thank you. I hope um, everyone will join us next month for our final Teaching Artist Tuesday of the season, uh, May 17th. We'll be focusing on some of the um, you know, themes discussed even during today's webinar, thinking about resiliency in your practice, um, thinking about activism and teaching artistry and more. So we'll get to hear from fabulous teaching artists here in the state, and we'll be sharing more information soon. But please don't hesitate to reach out to me or Lenora in the meantime, if you have any questions about teaching our Tuesdays, about the certificate program or about grants and resources here at the North Carolina Arts Council. So thank you, thank you all for your time and I look forward to staying in communication. All right, thanks everybody. Go to our YouTube channel, go to our Facebook and social media pages and we look forward to continuing our work here in North Carolina.